Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Molly's Salon. And this is our weekly program every Thursday where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. And we're living through a critical time in American history with the COVID-19 pandemic and a vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. Our guests are a variety of artists and leaders discussing new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as showing us glimmers of hope for the future. And what a glimmer of hope we got this week uh, when President Biden announced that uh, by the end of May, there will be enough vaccines for every adult in the United States. Fantastic news. My guests this week are Pam McKinnon, who's a director and artistic director from ACT. She's a wonderful director. You've seen her work a few times at Arena Stage. Riley Temple, a teacher and a preacher on art and theology. He's the author of Aunt Esther's Children Redeemed, Journeys to Freedom in August Wilson's 10 plays of the 20th century, Black America and former Arena Stage board president. Pam McKinnon is celebrating her second season as ACT's artistic director. She's a Tony Drama Desk and Obie Award-winning director, having directed upwards of 70 productions around the country, off-Broadway, on-Broadway. Arena audiences will remember her beautiful work from Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and A Delicate Balance. She's an artistic associate with the Roundabout Theater Company an advisory board member of Club Thumb and an alumni of the Drama League Women's Project and Lincoln Center Theater's Director Lab. Uh, she's also the executive board president of the Stage Directors and Choreographer Society. Thank you for that, Pam, that's my union. She grew up in Toronto, Canadian and Buffalo, American, uh, acted through her teens. I would have loved to have seen that. Uh, majored in economics and political science at the University of Toronto and briefly pursued a PhD in political science at UC San Diego before returning to her true passion, theater. It's great to see you, Pam. Nice to see you too, Molly. Happy to be here. Yeah, I was, I loved performing. There was one time in junior high, I was in a George M. Cohen musical, 45 minutes from Broadway, and I was already very tall. And so I played the matriarch, like the, the heavy drinking matriarch. And um, I, uh, I fainted. Like I saw my daughter kiss a boy or something like that. And so I had to faint on stage and two of the four performances, people in the audience spontaneously applauded at my fainting. Like there was something wow. about the timing that was just right. <laughs> and I loved that, I loved it. And then stepped away from it at a certain point, but I still kind of love it. I mean, that's, but you, I do it more conversationally than on stage, yeah. Don't you think it makes a difference so directors who were actors as opposed to directors who uh, don't understand what that art form is? Absolutely. And there was even, um, I had a little refresher moment. I was doing a play at the Intamon Theater in Seattle. This was probably like 12, 13, 14 years ago. And um, it, we were in previews and one of my actors had to be rushed to the hospital, wound up being fine, but an emergency had to go to the hospital. And it was an older gentleman and my, my diligent stage management team, it was a larger cast play. Um, my diligent stage management team started to like rip apart sort of a smaller track and this person on book could be, you know, that missing actor, but then someone else could be his small part kind of thing. And I said, look, if I were a man, we would have already hopped to the directors going on tonight on book. And so I said, it's going to be odd anyway. It's going to be a suspension of belief or whatever that phrase is in any case. And so I went on and this was with a professional company. It's my first time on stage since early college. <laughs> I was backstage with script in hand. Um, the, the, the opening scene was with my partner, still John Procaccino. Um, wow. I, so it, this, this, was, um, this was all the King's men and I played Judge Monty Irwin, the last reputable honest judge in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> my first scene was with John, my boyfriend, and he was so mortified by it all. At the end of the evening, he said, look, I've already reconciled in myself that I 
have dedicated my life to pretending, but tonight I had to pretend to pretend. <laughs> Um, so that was John's great line. But for me, I mean, going back to what you said, I mean, for me, just even like the romance of standing in the wings and watching the lights change color before making an entrance with a group of people or the moments that of course, as a director, I didn't know. So this was at the Intamon Theater, a, a semicircle thrust with not great acoustics. And my preview notes as a director had sort of gotten to that boring place of you just have to be louder. I can't hear you, you just have to be. So I stepped on stage and people were like, big projection, you know, you were like whispering to someone like this with a basso voice. And I was like, oh dear God, that's what it means. So it was a great, you know, a great hit of like, oh, that's what I'm asking people to do. It's, a, it's technical, it's vulnerable, it's furthering story, but it's, it's, so, it's so physical. Um, so yeah, that was a great reminder. I love that, I love that. Yeah, I used to act as well. And finally stopped because I found that the work that I was doing uh, was very good, very deep, but it was always the same. So I would be the prostitute as Molly. I would be uh, the uh, social worker as Molly. I would be the concert <laughs> nice. violinist as nice. Molly. So eventually I just started sitting further and further back in the house and I realized, no, I'm a director. Right. I, need, I can I be need, I need, director as Molly. I need to be a director. But... <laughs> I think that there is something alchemical uh, that happens uh, when you're on stage. There's there's a there's a there's a joy and an exhilaration that you can uh, never know if if you're as as a director you've never experienced it. Yeah. And the level of fear that an actor goes through it's 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 like facing the lions every night for some people. Absolutely. And if you don't get it, you don't get it. Um, so. I, 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 from that night on stage as Judge Monty Irwin getting lost, <laughs> lost in a scene partner's eyes. Like the color of his eyes under <laughs> stage light had little flecks of green and like it's a, vi it's a visceral memory that I will never, never lose. Um, and just like, you know, sort of I was on book, but looking at him and it, it, <laughs> it love, like you kind of fall in love with people. Like I, like, yeah, it's amazing, it's powerful. You do, you do, and we can't wait to get back to it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I just wanna talk about the pandemic for a moment. Uh, we're just a few days shy of being dark for a year, right? It's like another week or 10 days. And uh, I know that you have adapted and created new ways to perform. And in some ways, as you said the other day, we've become television producers in the pandemic. Uh, so talk to us about how ACT has continued the work and what's revelatory about it for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, one, one would think, and I think sometimes from the outside, it might seem like theaters are on pause, but it's only one element of a theater, at least in my experience, that, that, that is on pause. And that for ACT is its in-person main stage programming and every el everything else is kind of firing on all cylinders with fewer people to make it. Um, because unfortunately we had to let go of a lot of our staff. Um, and uh, I mean, what's, I mean, we, we also at, at American Conservatory Theater have within it a Masters of Fine Arts actor training program. And while we didn't take on a class this fall, um, there are two years of, of acting students that are still pursuing their MFA. It's all been remote with only a couple exceptions that have been like outdoor, an outdoor moment that we grabbed. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I feel like my, my teachers, my students, the, 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 the artists that are, are working in the conservatory pivoted really fast in April of 2020 at the top of the pandemic and kind of led the way for the rest of the organization. It's mainly work done on Zoom um, and then other, other virtual platforms. And, um, you know, these acting students, like I, I feel quite often like acting students who get an MFA when they leave their training program might have to do some additional classes, um, especially for like on camera work. Well, that's not gonna be an issue with these, with these students. They might wanna take some additional classes that are 
you know, in-person movement, though they've been doing a lot of movement in their own in their own homes, you know, I end with, with these classes. But it's, I mean, I mean the I mean the revelation I've found both with the conservatory as well as main stage is that we've been partnering more with other organizations and as a big theater, it's not like we need to find another big theater to partner with. It can be a very small theater. So we partnered with Perseverance Theater, you know, up, right. up, up, up in Juneau. Um, and, you know, I think before this moment of virtual theater making, that just wouldn't have occurred to us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a smaller theater. Um, it's way up the coast. And, you know, there was a project that we both felt very passionately about and came out of the conservatory. And then we, re and then we remounted it sort of more in its professional arena. Um, and that's been, that's been great. And those, and those kind of revelations, you know, I hope we pull, pull through, um, you know, so it's not about, you know, it's not about the big boys needing to partner with each other. It, you know, if, if it's the right project, it can be with anyone, you know, as long as like the values align, the artistic, you know, interest aligns, let's figure out a way to, you know, really work together. So that's been really great. Um, you know, we're also working with Woolly Mammoth Theater, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, across, you know, in, in, in your town now. Um, and, you know, sort of similarly, we're, we're, that's a smaller theater, larger theater. Um, we're, we're filming um, a play with music that was first done in Brooklyn at the Bushwick Star. And we're really making a movie um, and so that's you know we wouldn't have done that otherwise and that might be something we do on occasion I mean I know I know that you know you at the, early in the pandemic we were in some zoom room and you said you feel like you're getting back to sort of your like you know well why don't we just make a let's let's just make it and we can just make a movie and we all have these phones that can do more than you know a large computing room you know could do in the 90s um so we have we have you know we have a skill set as storytellers um and i think sort of theater people can also like step into um it's like or step onto steep learning curves and not be afraid um, or even if we're afraid, we do it anyway. Like we sort of set deadlines, like, you know, like opening nights in theater are real and they're, they're firm and they're deadlines. And once you say yes, you kind of have to get there. Um, and so we're doing a lot of stuff that is sort of like live TV through Zoom, making a movie where um, we just, uh, I've, I'm going to be working with a wonderful Bay Area playwright, Christopher Chen on an interactive Zoom play. I just got a draft yesterday and it is fantastic. And it's sort of scary, creepy. It's about a, a con artist and leads, leads the audience through both explaining a long con, but ultimately also conning them um, and what is real and what is not. Um, and it's really written for this medium. So I love it. It's exciting. I mean, it's I all daunting, it. but it's yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's intensely creative. I, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to make sure that we just talk for a moment because you have done productions of Who's Afraid of Virginia uh, Wolf and A Delicate Balance at Arena Stage by Edward Albee. And um, Edward uh, was a great friend of yours. And it's often so important for a writer and a director to find each other. And how did you find each other? I was, um, I was workshopping a new play at the O'Neill Center. And so, uh, and I, I, I hit it off with uh, a then literary manager of a theater in Philadelphia who thought I might be a good fit for Edward's play, the play about the baby that they were going to do in the subsequent season. And my agent knew Edward, this was in 2001, knew Edward because he uh, worked on Edward's foreign rights. This is when my agent was George Lane's assistant at William Morris. So agency doesn't exist anymore. My agent is now, you know, a, a, an agent, not a junior, all that stuff. But so, so my agent set up a lunch with Edward Albee. 
my agent's final parting words to me were, don't be nervous because Edward will smell it on you and he won't respect you. Well, that of course <laughs> made me nervous for the first time. It was horrible, it was horrible. But, but, but it was great. My first time meeting Edward was over a specific play. And for me, at least, it was the best way for a young director with very few credits, um, professional credits, to meet a writer because we were talking about something very specific, talking about a play of his. And we had lunch and um, hit it off nominally. I realized years later that probably that was a job interview. Like, Probably, right? I mean, I thought I had the job Absolutely. and I was there to discuss discuss a play with Edward, but I'm sure in retrospect, he was going to decide that I was do doing it or not. And I don't remember why, but we happened to rehearse that play in New York, even though it was eventually done in Philadelphia. This was when Edward was, um, you know, sort of a pig in shit. He was in rehearsal for The Goat for Broadway and Emily Mann was also rehearsing a play of his all over for the McCarter, but also right. rehearsing it in New York. And ultimately that had a wonderful off-Broadway run. And my play about the baby was being rehearsed in New York and he put it in his calendar. So once a week he showed up, my, showed up at my rehearsal hall. And again, a great way for a director to get to know a writer. Um, and we just like weekly had a check in. He could see progress. We grew to enjoy each other, but in a very professional setting. It's not like I met him at a party. Um, and um, we just got to know each other. And then the following season, the Alley Theater in Houston, where I had worked once, had me on a list of directors that they put before Edward Albee when they got the rights to have the regional premiere of The Goat, which had been very successful the prior Broadway season, Edward recognized my name and said, she's quite good, let's hire her. <laughs> and so there's, there's the beginning. The beginning of the relationship. That's, it was that's fantastic. Work. It was through work and sort of side by side, like he would you know, come to rehearsal, sit to my right, you know, and sometimes grumbly and sometimes excitedly give me a note or two, but it was just getting to know each other. Through, through the work. That's you know, great. At, 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 at the Alley Theater and the Goat, it was the first time he had ever seen a teenager play that teenage boy role. And Ooh. so for, he was again, just like so excited of like, I, I, I wrote a real 16 year old. I wrote a contemporary 16 year old. So I also got him, you know, had I met him through working, let's say on Virginia Wool for a delicate balance first, we probably wouldn't have ever gotten to know each other because those plays were sort of like, uh, God, these 50 year old plays, why do people want to do them? But I got to know Edward Albee through his then brand new plays. And eventually Beautiful. I did some world, you know, world premieres of his work as well as, you know, as well as his 50 year old plays ultimately, but. Yeah. Well, we could talk forever, Pam, but we're, we're, we're at an end. And I, I just want to, nice. I just want to thank you so much. Uh, for uh, coming on. It's great to see you. And it's really been a pleasure to watch you uh, grow and uh, change ACT. So oh, congratulations thanks, on all And hopefully that. see you in the fall, right? Tony Stone. Absolutely. With Tony I always Stone love working at, at arena, arena Stage. Yeah. We I always love having you. you. Great. Bye. All right. Thanks, Molly. Take care. Bye-bye. And Riley Temple, he's a teacher. He's a preacher on art and theology. Uh, he's currently working on a collaborative project in anticipation of the centennial of the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. He's a candidate for the Doctor of Ministry degree from the Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria, Virginia. He practiced telecommunications law in Washington, D.C. for over 40 years, and his public service included terms as communications counsel to the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, Transportation, He's been on a bunch of boards uh, and currently he's a trustee at WITA, National Archives Foundation. And of course, most important for us was a member of ARENA's board and trustees and served as president from 1993 to 1996. It's great to see you, Riley. Oh, it's good to see you, Molly. You know, I loved uh, the, your conversation with Pam so much. That was, I'm regretful that, that we have to come to me at this point. I could listen to that all night long. Oh, no. Well, well, uh, we're, we're excited about hearing you, too. Well, 
it's it's really fun to hear uh, directors talk about their relationships with playwrights or the work that they're doing. Ab absolutely. And, um, you know, you've had uh, such a deep relationship with August Wilson's work. And um, did you get to know him during his life, Riley? You know, the um, <clears throat> when Kenny and I uh, began our collaboration on the um, on True Colors, the first play that we did was Fences, and it was at the 14th Street Playhouse in Atlanta. Now, I had briefly met August Wilson when he was at the Kennedy Center mm -hmm. um, doing King Headley. And the, you know, the cast was on book. Um, Viola Davis was in it. It's, you know, that, that when she gave that speech, I said, oh, God, she's going to get a Tony Award. And sure enough, she did. But it, the play was four hours long. And he was, he was standing outside smoking, and he was in no mood to chat. So I, I put that aside. But when he came to the opening, the first play of True Colors, it was Fences, we all went backstage before the curtain. And we all prayed together. And then we went out into the audience and I sat next to him. As they performed, uh, Eugene Lee mm -hmm. was Troy. Mm. And I'm sorry, I don't remember who was mm. playing Rose, but it was wonderful to hear August Wilson grunt, <laughs> laugh, Oh God! You know, <laughs> groan about a moment in the in the play, and um, and so that's my that was my August Wilson moment. I was in seventh heaven. I love it. I love it. You know, uh, you mentioned Kenny. Uh, you were uh, really important in the founding of Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater uh, in Atlanta, which is a very important theater for our audience members to know about. It's now led by Jamil Jude, who was mm -hmm. a former Alan Lee Hughes fellow at Arena. How have you enjoyed watching the organization grow and flourish? Oh, it, it is, um, it's astonishing to me. And, and, and it's, I wish I could say that I have great pride, but I'm not there every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing the work every day, but I am extremely proud of what we put together. You know, Kenny and I, he was actually a candidate for your job, Molly. And when you got the job, later he and I had dinner together. He was here doing something. I think it was Blues for an Alabama Sky that he came right. here to do. Yep. And um, I think it was in your first season. And we had dinner together and I said, Kenny, America does not have a professional black theater company of high artistic merit. Not since the Negro Ensemble Company. Right. And we need one. And I think you should do it. And we talked about it and talked. He said, well, if I do it, are you in? I said, absolutely. We started that company with an initial investment, I think of $150,000. Wow. Now it's almost 20 years old. <laughs> it has a season and subscribers. I mean, I'm just in awe. So I'm enormously proud of that. That's so incredible. You know, you, you've, you've been such a mover and a shaker, Riley. That kind of uh, inspirational, creation that that happened on a theater company is profound and you've been a major patron of the arts and you're a pastor so what sort of role do you think theater and art in the larger sense uh, plays in the moral and spiritual life of its viewers it's a big question you know I was finding I was thinking when you were talking to Pam a few minutes ago about how the similarities between worship and theater. And I read an essay when I was in seminary 
And the writer was talking about a young theologian, a feminist theologian, she talked about um, what does it mean when you say that um, the Holy Spirit was, was among us? Now, in an Episcopal seminary, you don't often hear talk about Holy Spirit being in the room. Oh, the Holy Spirit was here. No, that's not what happened. It's, it's kind of, you know, like nailed down uh, emotionally. Um, but her language was, I guess the easiest thing to say, she said, was that something happened. Uh -huh. I have seen that in worship. Yeah. And God knows I've seen it in the theater. Yeah, absolutely. When whatever it is, that ineffable thing. Yep. Yep. And you say, Phew, something happened. Oof. I love that, Riley. I'm going, I will remember that. Mm. Riley, you were a great friend of uh, someone very important to Washington, D.C., in the country who just uh, died this uh, last week. A towering man, charming, charismatic. Uh, Vernon Jordan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, I'd love it if you just tell us a story because I know some so many people who are listening to this tonight uh, knew or saw Vernon Jordan uh, and he had just an incredible impact on this city and the country. You know, um, I was saying this to his son-in-law earlier today, how privileged I have felt to be in the company of Vernon Jordan for so many years. Um, when he was sick and he was in the hospital, I would occasionally go over and just sit with him and we would pray together. And then sometimes after I had finished, he would take my hand and he would pray for me. Mm. And someone said to me, did you ever think in a million years that, you know, you'd be ministering to somebody like Vernon Jordan? And I said, well, I don't see it that way. It's a humbling experience for me to be around someone of such enormous capacity and generosity of spirit. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I began to think, am I doing enough? Mm. Mm. So it's a challenge to me. I'll tell you a story. For a while, he chaired the Economic Club of Washington. Right. And, you know, as you know, they have uh, lunches and dinners and all these people get together. And, um, and he would occasionally call me to fill out one of his tables. I think he's even trying to set me up one time with Ken Melman. But that didn't <laughs> so, um, so I was at this table of and there, were, there was a group of young men, black young men, clearly, you know, on the upswing, career-wise, meteoric rise. And the honored guest that night was Ken Chenault, who was the chairman of the board of American Express. Vernon was a member of the board of directors of American Express for many years. Vernon brought Ken Chenault over to the table. And one by one, he introduced each of these guys their names, where they were from, where they went to school, what they were doing, and what he thought they, where he thought they should go and go going. Mm. I sat back and watched in awe. Mm. And I said, this is the way it's done. Mm. I got an image of someone, a big bird, taking wings and gathering in, or someone reaching down and pulling up. Or as Amy Sherrill said of David Driscoll the other night in that, wonderful documentary on black art. She said, David always sent the elevator back down. Vernon Jordan always sent the elevator back down. Mm. Mm. Oh, I love that, Riley. And that's who he was. I love that. And I know we only have a couple minutes left. So I would love uh, to know from you, where are you seeing glimmers of hope in this moment? <laughs> I'll share a story with you, um, and it's about race. Um, it was at the end 
of Barack Obama's first, second term. And I had gone to a screening of uh, Selma and Ava DuVernay was there and you know, all the people and John Lewis was on the stage and there was at the museum. And so, you know, this amphitheater. And so at the end of the screening I, and the program, I went down to the stage and I talked to John Lewis and I said, you know, I'm beginning to lose hope for racial, racial reconciliation in America. Mm. Molly, you would have thought that I had pierced him with a knife. Mm. His eyes bucked out, he took a big gasp of breath, he took me by the shoulders and he backed me, walked me over to a wall. You put his finger in my chest, you must never lose hope. Yeah. We cannot survive without hope. We are making progress. Don't lose hope. You cannot do that. Mm. There are times, like January 6th, when I begin to think that there is no hope for race, racial reconciliation. There are times today that I felt that way when people are still likening it and finding some equivalency with Black Lives Matter when we know that's not true. Right. But I have hope because I see so many young people <laughs> who are carrying on. This is another Vernon Jordan story. I told him, I said, you know, I'm preaching tomorrow. He said, what are you gonna preach about? I said, Black Lives Matter, what are you gonna say? I said that they are worthy descendants and continuers of the dream mm. of getting it done. And yep. he said, you be careful with that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they haven't read you know, Bla uh, uh, Souls of Black Folk or James Baldwin. And I said, well, we don't know that. But secondly, it doesn't matter, Vernon. They're answering a call. Yeah. And we should support them in answering that call. He agreed. Beautiful, Riley. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for, you, Molly, for, for coming me. on. It's just beautiful to talk to you. Thank and you. thank you for uh, being the head of the committee that brought me to Arena Stage. I will always love you for that. Best thing I've ever done for Arena Stage. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Riley. All right. All right. Can't wait to see you at the theater for real. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Wonderful guests tonight. Oh, wonderful guests. My guest next week will be Brad Oscar, who is an actor with uh, projects like Arena's Damn Yankees and Cabaret he does a lot of acting in New York. Be terrific to have him. And, and he's a Washington DC person. He is from here, his family's from here. And Whitney Hubbard, she's a health insurance specialist at Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And she's the president of Arena Stage's Young Patrons Board. So you're seeing Riley tonight and uh, next week you will see Whitney. And for tonight's gift of art, uh, we have a new project at Arena Stage called Arena Riffs. And we've gone out and we have commissioned three different composers to write musical pieces on whatever subject they want, which they are filming and putting the music together uh, in uh, 20 to 30 minute pieces. And there will be uh, three of them. Uh, one that will be Sama Yeni 24, another one, uh, Rona Siddiqui, and the third one is uh, the Bengsons, who will bring uh, their uh, piece to us uh, starting in about, I think in about 10 days. Uh, they, are, uh, they write story and song together in an intimate portrait. Uh, they celebrate joy during difficult times. It is premiering March 17th. They're married, they're composing and performing duo uh, who have performed across the country and around the world. And their video, which you will see, is the Keep Going song. This is not the one that's the arena riff, but this is something earlier, but it's already been viewed over uh, 4 million times. And I wanted to show it to you to whet your appetite for arena riffs. Thanks for being with us tonight. This is the keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on.
keep going on song this is a keep going keep going keep going keep going on keep going on song this is a keep going hey, keep going hey, keep going hey, keep going hey, on keep going on song this i am abigail going, and this is sean and going, we're so glad that you turned on. this on and welcomed us into song. your home You are welcome into our home. We're in Dayton, Ohio. We're in Sean's parents' house. My parents' house. Sean's parents' house. We were in Louisville when the shit hit, and we packed our three-year-old into a car. We drove kind of far. We drove here, and we've been so lucky and blessed to be safely here. And we thought we'd be here for like ten days. What did we know? What did we know? What did we know? We thought we knew a lot. We thought we knew a lot. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on. Keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going on. Keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going. Mostly healthy. We've been okay. Are you okay? Are you all right? Are you okay? Are you all right? Are you okay? I hope your body is whole tonight. And if your heart is breaking, I hope it's breaking open. And if your breath is shaking, I hope it's shaking through. And then I hope that you've watched a lot of really great television, like a lot of it. And I hope that you find a hand lotion that actually makes your skin feel better. And I hope that you have enough to eat. I hope you're getting enough sleep. And I hope you have enough good company or enough good memory to last you a long